this. You know, this is showing um, the median and the mean and the 25th and 75th percentile. So you see there's quite a lot of variation in belief, but what is tracking is that it's uh, clearly under what the life table five-year probability uh, would be. So people are extremely uh, pessimistic. I didn't say so, but feel free to, to interrupt me. Uh, and I don't know, sometimes I can't see the raise hand, but feel free to just pick up. Um, it's nice to have questions um, as we go. So, you know, these survival expectations are likely to be crucial for human capital uh, investment. And the fact that they're pessimistic might mean that people are not making uh, optimal choices. Uh, we know that, you know, from other studies that life expectancy slash survival expectation influence education, savings, labor market outcome, uh, and health decisions. Um, and in a related paper with Hans Peter, one of the co-author of the present paper, we've um, used data on subjective expectation from the same sample on survival, on HIV transmission risk, and on HIV status. And we found that those were important in the decision to, uh, for individuals to engage in risky sexual behavior. And we were having some simulation exercises where we were saying, you know, what happened if people had accurate perception, would that change their behavior? And we found that, you know, if people had accurate perception about mortality risk, that would decrease their risky sex because, you know, they, there is more incentive to protect uh, uh, your health if you're going to live longer. And we also had, this was, a, you know, a, different context, but we also had that people had accurate perception about the transmission risk of HIV that would actually increase their risky sex. And this is also because this one tend to be quite pessimistic. So people think it's very likely you become infected if you have uh, sex with someone with HIV positive, and if you were telling them the truth, then they, they, they would um, uh, increase uh, their risky sexual behavior. So this, you know, kind of paper motivated us to uh, uh, write another grant proposal and um, get some funded to implement an intervention where we provided information on mortality risk to these individuals in rural Malawi uh, using an, uh, an RCT design. So what I'm going to talk about today is about this, this, uh, these studies. And we're going to have data on both the survival expectation and the risky sexual behavior uh, to investigate how the uh, intervention was effective at changing, on the one hand, the expectation, and then in turn, uh, risky sexual behavior. And what is quite interesting is that the subjective expectation will turn out to be critical to understand the mechanism for why our intervention uh, worked. And um, this was, to be honest, not the, the mechanism we had anticipated with. And if we didn't have this data, I think we would have wrongly uh, made inference on, on how we managed to change behavior. Any question here? We're good? Yeah, have, have you considered uh, uh, this bias of expectations, have, have you considered the condition, is it, is, it, is it a rational expectation given the lack of information or is it something more fundamental than that? Because, you know, sort of leaping into expectations being biased uh, in, in a sort of uh, a, a non-qualified uh, statement uh, is is a, is a bit jarring. So, so the only thing I can say, because it's very hard to know how people formulate their expectation, is that the expectation about the future is inaccurate compared to objective um, uh, information about life table in Malawi. Now, they, we have evidence that they use a lot of available information to formulate this expectation. You know, for example, it's correlated with uh, how many people have died in their village, how many funerals they have attended this year, whether their parents died uh, old or young. Um, it's also correlated, I'm going to show one graph about, uh, you know, if we look uh, into the future about their actual survival. So there's, uh, you know, informational component here. Um, it's very hard for me to say what should be uh, the correct expectation uh, given, you know, the information they have because I don't know their information set. 
Um, the only thing I can say is that uh, we have some objective information about uh, their actual risk. They underestimate these actual risk and we could potentially uh, try to shape their current perception by providing information about that risk. Does that answer your question? Well, I, I understand what you say. Uh, but, but still, I'd like to, I think I'd like to see or hear something a bit deeper about how these expectations are formed. Uh, but I, I, I understand that uh, you used what information that you, that you have. Uh, yeah. So we, we can talk about it because one way to pick, I mean, one way to identify um, this idea of expectation formation is to provide information to people and to see how they update based on this information. So here to some extent we're doing that. Uh, we're going to give them information and we're going to see how responsive their subjective beliefs are. Um, and maybe I will not go, uh, I think we are able to go at quite a several layer, but maybe not even as deep. I'm not going to say this is the type of updating rule um, that is going on, but maybe we can talk at the end um, and discuss some more and I'll be um, you know, very happy to, to get feedback and comments on that. Thank you. Okay, so um, briefly on uh, literature. Uh, so, you know, we're, I cited a few of these paper um, in, in my motivation. We're, you know, part of a literature that looks at how survival uh, expectation or, you know, life expectancy improve health behavior. Um, and here we're going to exploit this experimental uh, variation. We're also part of a literature that look at the effect of information on health behavior and, and human capital investment. You know, if you look at the literature, there's uh, a bit of, of everything, you know, some health uh, campaign influence behaviors, others are not successful at doing so. And, so, you know, one important missing link is that typically we don't observe the expectation. So it's not clear um, why, you know, an information campaign work or doesn't work, um, because we don't really know whether it has changed the belief it was targeting uh, to change, which in turn is expected to, to change behavior. Um, in the education domain, there's a little bit more of evidence with expectation data um, uh, in developing countries and in the US uh, as well, showing that, you know, when you provide information, for example, about the returns to uh, schooling, um, students update their belief about their return to schooling, and that has implication on educational uh, investment. So, Arlen, a quick question about this. Yeah. Oh, is it possible that such information can also have negative effects in the sense that if I've never smoked in my life and I think I'll live to 95 and you come in and tell me that no, you're, you live only to 90. So I might just react by saying, oh, why should I not smoke anymore? Because, you know, I thought I was doing good, but it doesn't help. Yes, I, th I agree completely. So I think, you know, if people have a heterogeneous belief, then when you give information, it can actually, for some people, go the other way. Uh, and we're going to look a little bit at heterogeneity in, in this context, but I think, I think this points to uh, exactly the idea that if you don't really have the, the baseline belief or, you know, at least the, even the posterior belief, it's hard to know what the intervention did, right? So it could be that it changed belief, but, you know, it didn't change them enough to actually shape behavior, or it could be that people didn't update because they don't trust the information and that's why you see no change in behavior or it could be you change them you know in the wrong direction and maybe you have some average effect of some people going so i agree uh, this is kind of a fundamental uh, identification issue if you don't have the, the 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 fundamentals of the decision making process thanks um and then we're also part of this literature on um, the elicitation of probabilistic belief in developing countries, uh, which I contributed uh, quite a lot. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it today because there's quite a lot already. So 
I hope you can trust me at face value that um, survey respondents uh, understand and answer these probabilistic questions, even in low numeracy context, uh, that when we ask this question, they vary with observable characteristics in the same way as actual outcomes uh, do, um, that they are useful to predict future uh, behavior and economic decision. And one thing that is important is that there is a lot of heterogeneity in this belief. And so, you know, assuming that people have some type of uh, uh, rational expectation and everyone knows what will be the realization, the probability of the realization of certain events is going to be a strong assumption in, in many contexts. And this heterogeneity is hard to predict uh, based on uh, common demographic characteristics. Uh, so there's more, more to that. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the data. We were talking briefly. Uh, I don't know if everybody had joined uh, when we mentioned this. This is coming from the Malawi Longitudinal Study of Family and Health uh, that started in 98. I should update, there was a wave in 2020 now. Um, from 2012 onward, the survey focused on mature adults who are 45 uh, plus. Um, they're kind of an interesting uh, population for these for our purpose uh, because they have survived through periods with significant mortality fluctuation during their adult ages uh, and so it you know it might be particularly hard for them to uh, think about their mortality risk and the one of other people around them they are an uh, important player in the HIV uh, epidemic because they continue to be sexually active and um, they also contribute to transmission at younger age group. You know, there's this type of sugar daddies. This would be mostly male having sex with younger female. Um, and they also tend to have a riskier sexual behavior than their younger uh, counterpart. Finally, you know, there, this mature adult in Africa population is expected to triple by 2050. So it's important to think about policy uh, for this group. So there's some, a few important features uh, of the data. One of them is that uh, since 2006, we elicit uh, probabilistic expectations uh, about important life events with a focus on health and HIV. Um, this is elicited using a physical object. We use 10 beans, actually peanuts in, in this wave. Um, and so the respondents are asked to express, um, to pick the number of beans, to express the likelihood that they will die within a five year and 10 year period beginning today. So this is about themselves. We ask about their own mortality expectation. Can then we, quick yeah. question? Yes. Just curious. So is there any reason why you're focusing on uh, mature adults in your service above 45? So the reason is that we had um, initially a, a cohort of all age group and there was um, NIH budgetary cuts and we got some funding to focus on the mature adult because the aging in Africa is understudied. So that's the true reason why um, for a certain time, this panel survey focused on the uh, older individual. Now, since 2019, we got funding again and it's back to, um, well, we focused on 2090 only on the younger one. We hadn't interviewed for a while, but that's, that's the... the so you're assuming that there's no age-specific uh, selection there in the sense uh, of your uh, treatment effects? Um, so there is selection in the sense that, so this is, you know, we give information to people who are 45 plus, you know, in 2018 or 17, when we give them the information. So these are the survivor. I mean, they are really the survivor of HIV AIDS. Yes. So there might be selection. Um, I don't know if, so I don't know, maybe you have, I, I'm not sure that's a, a, a reason for concern in the sense that, you know, it's the same for treatment and control. And to some extent, the ones who have died are dead and maybe are not so much the focus of future HIV AIDS policy, even in other contexts. So even, I don't think that's too much an issue of external validity if you think about HIV in particular. Um, but yeah, truly, I mean, I, st I think of them as the survivor of HIV and, and, and that's an important population, yeah. Um, 
so going back to the mortality to this expectation so we ask about their own risk own mortality risk and then we also ask about population uh, mortality uh, expectation and they were asked to express the likelihood that someone of their gender and age would uh, um, die in the next five years um, and this person has different health status. So we ask them to consider someone who is healthy, someone who is HIV positive, someone who is sick with AIDS, and someone who is sick with AIDS and on antiretroviral uh, therapy. So for the purpose of um, you know, having one direction where we think about uh, this, this risk, I'm going to rescale them in terms of survival probabilities. And so what is important is I'm going to talk in various places about this own survival probabilities and population one. Before you move on, yeah. uh, in this case, uh, how, sens how sensitive it is for you to ask someone when he's going to die? So um, this is a an important question and we don't have a lot of so the n item non-response rate is quite low i don't have it on the top of my head but it's below five percent for sure it's slightly higher when we ask about themselves but than about others but it's not uh it's not that everyone is saying you know it's up to god and we can't say and things like that so we get quite a lot of um a very high response rate uh, for this uh, thing. I think it's a little bit uh, easier to think about what's the priority you will die at a certain in a certain time frame than asking, you know, at what age are you going to die? There's a you know there's this stochastic component uh, that maybe makes it easier. Um, at some point, we asked this age of death. I should check the non-response rate there as well, but I think it was not so uh, low, uh, not so high as well. Thank you. Uh, um, just, just a quick question. The population yeah. mortality expectation, is it specifically asking somebody in your society or somebody in yes, your country or anybody? Yes, in your community. In yeah, your yeah, community. So should, yeah, okay. I should specify that, yeah. So it's the, it's the local, you can think about it as the local, uh, local mortality risk. Um, just one thing, that's the only thing I'm going to show in terms of, you know, validity of this data. Um, this is showing the five-year survival probability about uh, oneself, uh, about, you know, so this own survival probability that we ask in 2010 and compare it with actual um, uh, survival uh, of people seven years later. And essentially what you can see is that uh, there's a higher, um, a much higher proportion of respondents who have died among those who say they had zero chance of surviving uh, in the next five years compared to those who said that there was a 100% chance of surviving to the next five years and it kind of, you know, monotonically uh, decreased according to their, their answer. So there's, you know, they are good predictor of, of actual uh, survival. There is, um, uh, you know, these are meaningful uh, answers. Okay, now let me talk about the information intervention. So, um, this had two components. Uh, the first one was essentially a narratives uh, that we delivered through videos where local people explain how they notice people live lo longer nowadays. And we also emphasized um, the reason why there was this gains in life expectancy. So this was, this is example of, of the, the, the videos. We had three of them. Uh, they are supposed to show mature adults. Um, and they're, you know, this one is saying I'm lucky, both my parents are alive, my grandparents were not so lucky, and this one, for example, emphasize uh, better access to healthcare uh, nowadays. The second one emphasized the, the availability and, and of antiretroviral therapy. You know, this woman is saying my husband is HIV positive, but he takes uh, the treatment, I make sure he takes them and, uh, and he's doing well. Uh, you know, my brother 10 year, years ago got sick and died uh, straight away. And this is yet another person who was emphasizing, you know, again, different gains and also in particular, uh, fewer food uh, shortages nowadays compared to before. And that's motivated by the idea that these stories, you know, these narratives are uh, helping people to form their expectation and they are more likely to retain this information uh, through stories. The other part, um, so these narratives say, 
tell to people, you know, people are living longer, but then we provide precise statistical information uh, showing the five year and 10 year survival probabilities for individuals of the same age and gender based on recent estimates from Malawi. Um, and those were presented visually a little bit in the same way as we, you know, elicit this belief. Uh, so everyone will see only one of these uh, leaflets uh, corresponding to their uh, gender and age group. Uh, and so that we would tell respondents, you know, if you look, let's consider 10 people, 10 women uh, your age uh, today in Malawi, 10 are alive. Um, and if we come back in five years, you know, the red person denotes someone who would be dead. So approximately one would be, would have died and nine will still be alive. And if we come 10 years from now, now, you know, between two and three person have died and between seven and eight will still uh, be alive. So the idea is to convey these, uh, you know, these statistical uh, figures in terms of population. Uh, so Adeline, uh, uh, these have nothing about sexual behavior. There's nothing about sexual behavior. Okay. And this is not... Um, condition on HIV status or not. Okay. To some extent, I mean, uh, yeah, I also, I was kind of interested in trying to give information, you know, if you're healthy or if you're HIV positive, this is an intervention we consider. We just felt it was too cognitively burdensome to give all this uh, different information. So that's, yeah, there is, we never mentioned sexual behavior um, anywhere uh, in, this, in this context or HIV. So let me just walk you through the timeline of, of the data collection and, and in information. So, 2017 is when we did our, our what served as our baseline survey, which is the one of the wave of the, this mature adult uh, cohort. We collected this own and population mortality expectation. We also have expectation related to HIV risk. Uh, and we also collected their uh, sexual behavior in the last 12 months. Um, about two weeks after the baseline survey, another team came and um, provided to respondents living in the uh, village treatment this information that I just described, showing these videos on a tablet and showing this, this leaflet with the statistical information. So the randomization was done at the village level to avoid spillover uh, effect. And um, essentially, we, this is stratified by region and village size. So we, we did some pairing of village according to their site within a region. And then the two largest one, you know, one of them, we pair them and one of them was control and the other treatment to ensure that we have um, enough, you know, similar sample size in treatment and control. And we have about 145 villages um, in, in the overall. So that was two weeks after the baseline survey. And a few days after, because this is something that has been done regularly, uh, there's also a an, an team of nurses who came um, and uh, offered respondents to take uh, HIV test. Uh, this is rapid HIV. The uptake was almost universal and everybody almost found their test results. And after this test result, we elicited this expectation again, uh, uh, this time only about own mortality uh, expectation. So that will be like a short term measure for us that that will be useful. Then, you know, a year time uh, elapses and in 2018, one year after the follow the baseline, we conduct a follow up survey where we ask the same um, expectation about own and population mortality and their sexual uh, behavior. Any question on this timeline or no? Okay. So let me talk a little bit about descriptive statistics. Um, so on average, our respondents are 59 year old. 7.5% uh, is HIV positive. They have you know, 3.5 years of schooling. Um, if we look at the expectation, they think they have a 67% chance on average of surviving to the next five years. Um, if we look at how their belief about this hypothetical, you know, population uh, survival work, they they operate, you know, in the in the direction we would anticipate. They expect that someone healthy who is not HIV positive would have a 70% chance of survival. Someone who is HIV positive. Uh, you know, would have a lower survival of 62% and someone who is sick with AIDS, you know, would go back to a 49% chance on average of survival. 
and going back to 57% for those who also are on antiretroviral therapy. So they know that ART, you know, um, increases life expectancy of HIV positive people. Um, this is their belief about being infected. Uh, they think they have 18, 19% chance of being infected uh, with HIV. In terms of sexual behavior, which will be kind of our main behavioral outcome, um, about 35% uh, have not had sex in the last uh, 12 months, uh, but the most common behavior, 57% is to have sex with, their, with one partner. Uh, condom use is quite infrequent, uh, and this is about 1% who have had sex with multiple partner in the last 12 months and report using condom in the last intercourse. This is not measured exactly in the same uh, time horizon. Uh, and 6% have uh, had multiple partner um, in the last 12 months. In terms of balance, if we look at treated and control uh, respondents, this is very similar. Um, there is one slight imbalance uh, at the eight, you know, nine percentage point level, which is um, in terms of HIV prevalence. So the treated group is slightly more HIV positive than the control group. Um, and you know, this is by chance because we did the, the randomization ourselves. And you know, when you look at binary events and you, your sample is not huge, that could happen. Um, when we look at the HIV negative respondents only, you know, everything is balanced. So in, in, in when I present the results, I have, you know, sometimes everybody, but then we have uh, other specification where we just look at the HIV negative or where we interact HIV status with treatment. Um, our, our sample of HIV positive is quite small to make a lot of meaningful inf inference about what happened to this HIV positive. Um, so I'm more comfortable talking about the HIV uh, negative respondents. Okay, let me talk a little bit, I don't want to spend too much time, but about a conceptual framework, um, thinking about how this um, expectation might influence risky sexual behavior and how the information we provided might uh, shape this, this expectation. So think about a sexually active uh, individual. Uh, we've actually now, we've kind of changed with two periods um, uh, uh, left to leave. In period one, the individual can uh, make two choices. Um, she can have sex with one partner only, so she can choose the safe sex option, or she can have sex with multiple partner, which is the risky sex option. And she will enjoy some utility from uh, uh, this action. In period two, for simplicity, there's no choice, um, but there's a health dependent utility. So, you know, if the respondent is still HIV negative, she enjoys more utility than if she has become uh, HIV positive um, out of her behavior in period one. Now in period one, I'm thinking about these various stage that mimic what happened in the data collection. So, in the first stage, we start, you know, respondents are endowed with individual specific belief, which will pertain to survival to the next period. It could be population and own survival, their HIV status, their spouse HIV status, and the HIV transmission risk associated with the various actions. So, you know, if you have sex only with your spouse, that will uh, only be a function of uh, your spouse HIV status. But if you have sex with other people, it may be a function of the local HIV prevalence. Then it's in stage two, this is our information treatment. Uh, respondents in the treatment group receive an information intervention. And so they might revise their prior belief based on this information. Here, I'm quite agnostic. You know, there's, if we tell individual people live longer, that could influence any, you know, many of these different expectations. So I'm not going to take a stance on, on what has been updated, but presumably there is some updating taking place. Uh, in stage three, people receive information, objective information about their HIV status. Um, and then in stage four, uh, they 
the, the, the decision maker chooses uh, his risky, uh, his sexual behavior. So risky sex or not. Um, I haven't given all the notation, but I'll walk you through quickly. Essentially, we end up having kind of a threshold model. This is the, um, the utility from um, having uh, risky sex as opposed to uh, safe sex. Uh, and the individual will choose risky sex if this is offsetting essentially the, the, the future uh, payoff uh, resulting from the action. So what happens if you have risky sex? You may have a higher risk of becoming HIV positive. This is the probability of becoming HIV positive associated with risky sex versus uh, having safe sex. This is a function of the local HIV prevalence. And the only thing that also matters is how much more likely you have to survive if you're HIV negative than if you have HIV positive. So that this is what is compared uh, in terms of this um, uh, benefit in the short term. So quick question about this. So yeah. aren't you assuming in the background that people understand how HIV spreads or it spreads? Right. So um, um, I, think, I think it's fair to say everyone knows it's uh, transmitted through sex mm -hmm. in, in this context nowadays. Um, what I'm, what I'm not assuming is that people know the HIV risk. So these, P these transmission probability are all subjective and individual specific in the same way that these survival are subjective and individual specific. So I'm assuming that people uh, know that you contract HIV through sex, which is, I don't think, a very strong assumption in the current context. You know, and if we ask, these people are aware that you're much more likely to become HIV positive if you have multiple sexual partner than if you have sex with one partner. Um, so let's think about this uh, information that we give them. Essentially what we tell them is uh, information about population mortality risk. So because they are you know, underestimated to begin with, our hypothesis is that this uh, information will shift upward, will lead to a, an upward revision of this population mortality risk. So we should expect a positive treatment effect. So this population mortality risk, they don't enter directly in the individual uh, decision-making process, but we think that these are likely input, this population mortality risk are likely input of individual uh, health risk. In particular, you know, it's, it's quite plausible that um, your own survival risk uh, is related to the population survival risk. So if I tell you you're going to live longer, we could expect an upward revision of their own survival risk. If you think you're going to live longer, again, that would promote safe, safe practice because there's more to, um, to gain by remaining uh, HIV uh, negative. Um, there's another way in which um, it could influence risky sexual behavior is that if I tell you, well, everyone is living longer, they could also think, and you know, the, one of the videos emphasized the role of, of uh, antiretroviral therapy, they could think, well, HIV positive people are now living longer. Um, this makes the pool of partner, this local HIV uh, prevalence, uh, riskier. As a result, you know, if now I have sex with someone in the community, I'm more likely to end up with an HIV positive individual and that increased the, the transmission risk uh, of extramarital affair. As a result, this could also promote uh, safe sex practice. So there's these two ways in which we think um, the population mortality risk you know, can have ramification on these health risk, individual health risks, which in turn can influence the decision making process. So having the data on expectation will allow us to, to see um, in which margin um, the, the information treatment is operating. So, sorry to interrupt again, yeah. but isn't there a third mechanism where people feel that we have actually won the battle against HIV? So I can go for riskier sex and I'll still be okay. I'll still live. So, so this, it could happen. This all goes actually about the relative weight of these two things in here. So what I'm saying here is that if they both increase of a similar amount, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, uh, there's no relative gain of survival in terms of being HIV positive, 
versus not, then, then this is what we would happen. If they increase, if they think, you know, there was three videos, two are emphasizing other gain, why emphasize HIV, for example, if they think, oh, well, the gains are mostly for the HIV negative, you know, if you think about these non-competitive, these competitive risk models, yeah. uh, then you would also get um, an improvement in, safe in sex, safe yeah. sex. Yeah. Uh, it could go sour, I agree, and people thinking, well, in the end, all the gains is driven by the fact that you're no, no longer doomed if you become HIV positive, and, and, and that could uh, still happen. Yeah. So again, we're gonna see in the data what, what we see, then it's, it's a bit of an empirical question. Um, but that's a very good point, yeah. So any question on this? This is kind of the mechanism. So it's the gist of the of the of the paper, really. So I want to have everybody with me uh, on that. Um, I was just wondering, did you? Um, yeah. sorry. Um, did you consider kind of the um like Bayesian overconfidence models, sort of um uh, Jean, uh, Jean Paul Benoit, I think it is at, at, at LBS. Um, you could have a Bayesian underconfidence model, um, which would be compatible with some of the information sets you're sort of looking at here. So it's it's not irrational for people to um, to have lower expectations about their own mortality, given a limited information set, um, and then you you give them more information, uh, particularly about their own health, um, and then yeah, it's, it's yes. Yeah, so sorry. So what's the question? So I agree with you. It's exactly what we're doing. Um, yeah, um, uh, it, it's it, you could it just sort of have you, have you seen kind of Bayesian overconfidence models? They're usually sort of the models which are usually used to look at things why people why uh, more than half of all people think they're a better than average driver. That's kind of the classic yeah, yeah, yeah. example. Yeah, um, yeah so, and you can sort of tweak the numbers on those and yes. get Bayesian underconfidence where it's rational for people yes. in the face of limited information. It's rational for people to have. Uh, worse expectations. I mean, there's various reasons why it's rational in this context. Um, and, you know, you can back out in the Bayesian way. One is that people also overestimate their HIV risk. So um, as a result, you know, they, they are pessimistic about their survival because they know that HIV positive people uh, live a lot less longer. They also overestimate this transmission risk. So there's a lot of reason why, you know, they might have this overestimation. Uh, um, so yeah, so I think that's consistent with this other confidence. And I don't think they have, you know, because death happened, but not that frequently, and their own death certainly doesn't happen frequently, it's hard for this to get corrected by frequentist uh, updating. Um, yeah, yeah. So we can go back to this because we'll see that the updating is is uh, is related to this overconfidence, I think. And maybe if you have, uh, we can talk again because there's one mechanism that I think play a role, which is kind of related to very tight prior, uh, but it's hard to pin down with the data we have. So we can go back to that later on if I, if I have an answer. Um, just briefly, in period two, nothing much happened. People enjoy their utility if they're alive. Uh, what is relevant still is that people will revise their belief. Um, one thing to keep in mind when I will talk about the belief revision is that uh, some belief pertain to outcome over which people have no control over, which is, for example, population survival or local HIV prevalence. And so these will be affected by the information we gave them only. Other people, you know, like your own HIV status is a result of your own behavior. You have partial control uh, uh, over some of these expectations. And so when we think about the revision process, it will have both a component, which is the, the result of the information intervention, but also any changes in behavior that the treatment has triggered. Um, so it's important to think, think about these. Okay, so let me move on to the empirical analysis. Uh, I'm going to start with the behavior uh, and then looking at the expectation to try to understand the treatment effect we see uh, on behavior. So the, um, the main uh, outcome uh, for sexual behavior are indices of riskiness of sex. Uh, we have um, three of them. Uh, one is just, you know, the extensive margin, whether people are sexually active versus not. The other one just focus on the number of partners. So you have no partner, one or multiple partners. It's a little bit noisy in the, the, the number of partner when it gets above two. So we just lump them into having multiple sex partner. This also matches our, our um, transmission risk question. Uh, 
Um, and then we have one more uh, index, which also bring the, the, the condom um, into the picture. So you can have a no sex, sex with one partner, multiple partner with condom and multiple partner without condom. So the risk is increasing. Uh, because of this type of risky uh, sex index, we use an ordered probit specification to estimate the treatment effect. Um, so here, this beta is the treatment effect of interest. We have a treatment equal to one if a response when it was in a treatment village and zero otherwise. Uh, we control for baseline sexual behavior uh, as well as age, gender, uh, and schooling, and also for uh, this village pair um, used in the randomization. And we also cluster standard error at the village level, which is the level of the, the randomization. So this is our main policy relevant finding is that for all these indices, what you can see is that the um, treatment effect uh, is negative uh, and precisely estimated. So the intervention reduced, reduced risky sexual behavior, both at the extensive margin, whether people have sex or not, but also at this intensive margin where we look at, at number of partners. These are the coefficient of an ordered probit. They don't make, uh, they are hard to interpret. So let me show you some predicted probabilities of the third column, which is the one that has the most comprehensive um, uh, index. So what you see is that, um, you know, in the control group, 33% of the respondents are predicted um, to not have sex as opposed to 36% of the respondents. So it's a three percentage point increase or an 8% increase in the safest uh, behavior. And if we look at the riskiest behavior, you know, we have 7.6% uh, of uh, respondents who have multiple partner without condom in the control group, as opposed to 6.4 in the treatment. This is a 1.2 percentage point different or a 19% decrease uh, in individual having multiple sex partner um, with uh, without condom. So these effects are quite large, you know, when we think about the quite light touch intervention that didn't mention sexual uh, behavior uh, at all. Um, if we look at the, the differential effect by gender, we see that for women, this is operating mostly through the extensive margin, they mostly stop having sex, while for men, we see it uh, along both the extensive and intensive uh, margin as well. Um, so one thing I want to mention, this is self-reported sexual behavior uh, with all the potential issues it might have as a self-reported uh, measure for something that uh, you know, may have uh, desirability bias. So we're, we do two things to address the concern, whether you know, the treatment effect is real or whether it's picking up some, something else. One is that we have um, a specification which allow for misclassification errors, uh, where people who engage in risky sex would lie and report they engage in safe sex, and we estimate these misclassification probabilities and we get similar results. The other robustness check, which I'm showing here, um, is looking at pregnancies uh, in a younger sample. So, you know, pregnancy would be an in is an indication for unprotected sex. Uh, or mature adult respondents are quite old to experience pregnancy themselves, if we think about the women. But what happened is that one year after our follow-up survey, we went back and interviewed this younger cohort. Uh, and we can look at the incidence of pregnancies in treated versus controlled villages. We know that these mature adults have sex with these younger uh, women. And what we see is that there is a, a reduction in uh, the incidence of having been pregnant essentially um, uh, in the past two years, uh, which is when you know, we could have seen an effect based on when the, our information treatment was uh, implemented. But we see nothing for um, respondents with a young uh, a child uh, for which you know, they would have had no time to have uh, been affected in their pregnancy decision uh, by the, the intervention. So this is like, a, you know, a hard measure. We don't expect any misreporting in, in pregnancy or, or the age of the children. Um, that shows that, you know, there was a change in sexual behavior in the treated uh, villages. No question? No? Okay. 
So I want to talk about another outcome, which is marriage. Um, so marriage, you can see it uh, in different ways. One is that it could also be a risk reduction strategy uh, in a sense that, uh, you know, you're committing to one partner now and presumably uh, if you're getting married, you're committing to, um, to having sex with that partner only. Uh, you can also think about marriage being, you know, now promoted by the fact that everyone, you think everyone is living longer, they might be uh, gained from marriage. Um, and so these are mature adults. They've, most all of them have ever been married, but in Malawi, divorces is very common. And so people are going through these stages of, you know, divorce uh, or widowhood and, and remarriage. Um, we see a positive treatment effect uh, on the likelihood of, of being married. And this is essentially driven by respondents who were not married at baseline. We don't see anything in, in, uh, in terms of maintaining uh, an existing relationship and we don't see an increase in divorce. So what we seem to see is a commitment for people to a, a partner, uh, which is consistent with what we observe in terms of the, the sexual uh, behavior. So we see this, you know, this, this other effect uh, on, on marriage. So quickly, so don't the results then show that people are marrying into marriage, like in a marriage without sex? So that's kind of not what you will want people to have. What do you mean marrying without sex? So when you go to the last table where, where people have stopped having sex altogether, yeah, that's positive. People yes. are marrying more often, but they're having sex less often. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean these are the same people, the one yeah, who true. have no yeah. sex, right? So if we look at frequency of sex, conditional on having sex, for example, that we don't see any difference. Um, I don't know. It's hard to tease out. Uh, but so it, it'll be yeah. nice. To, it'll be nice if you could show that these people who do not have sex are the ones who were having sex without marriage in the past. Yeah. Right. And that could be cool so yeah the sex and marriage if we could kind of combine having yeah, like you know sex and married kind of disaggregated yeah yeah that's a good point i guess that's we're not showing now okay thanks um Okay, now let me move on to the expectation. So, you know, we have these hypotheses. Uh, we try to uh, change their people's uh, accuracy of knowledge. And if we didn't have the expectation data, you know, this is where the paper would stop. Uh, to be completely fair, when we started the project, we had this Bakerian style hypothesis in mind. We're going to give them information about population survival risk. It's going to change their own survival risk and people are going to act on it and, and adopt uh, safe um, sex practices. So now we can actually try to test that with our expectation data. The, the, I'm going to look at the revision in belief from the follow-up from the follow-up to the baseline in a linear uh, regression that is quite similar in terms of the control than what we had before. Uh, we're going to have a treatment effect, the same characteristic uh, as earlier, and the, the pairs, the village pairs used in the randomization. So let me start with the population survival expectation. So this, you know, in the essence was what we gave information about and what we hope uh, to change. Um, so remember, this is the question asking, you know, what's the chance that someone your age and gender in your village who is healthy, for example, will be alive in the next five years. What we see here is a positive treatment effect for three of this population expectation. So they expect, uh, you know, pop, uh, individuals who are healthy to live longer, similarly in individuals who are HIV positive and the ones who are on antiretroviral therapy uh, as well. Um, you know, this is 4.2 uh, percentage point, the baseline was 70 percent, so it's about a 6 percent um, increase in, in this expectation. Um, one thing that, you know, we would expect in um, so, so just I should say one thing. Here we see nothing. We ne we didn't say anything about AIDS, uh, and we don't see any updating process. You know, not for anyone on AIDS who is not on antiretroviral therapy. So it seems to suggest you know they pay attention to to what we told them, and also you know this I just want to put forward that this was. Uh, elicited one year after the information. So, you know, it shows that they were able to understand what we told them and to retain it uh, for one year. 
One thing we, we see, we do not see is something which would be consistent with the Bayesian updating that we've talked a little bit earlier, uh, which is we don't see heterogeneity based on their uh, prior accuracy. So, you know, this is showing essentially the difference between their prior, their belief at baseline and the information we gave them. So everyone was a negative gap underestimated and everyone with a positive gap overestimated, we had most of the people here. And, you know, in a Bayesian setup, you would expect that those who underestimated uh, update upward and the other actually update downward. This is what you were saying to show that, you know, we, it might go the other way. What we see, these are just kernel regressions um, showing that everyone is re irrespective of their prior updated upward. This is the line for the uh, control group. This is the line for the treatment group. This is for the healthy. We get something, you know, not so straight, but uh, uh, similarly, the treated group is always above for um, the belief about someone who is sick with ADN and antiretroviral therapy. So it's not very consistent with the Bayesian model and it's more consistent with the fact that maybe the narratives provided by the video led everyone to believe there are these life expectancy gains rather than them really understanding the statistical information uh, we provided. This is my interpretation for this kind of general um, treatment effect. And you're not, yeah, I see you're talking about yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Can we also, like, can you also do this by interacting the treatment effect with the prior probability, not the yeah. difference? Uh, um, the idea being that those of those who have held on, those who have held on to really pessimistic beliefs know that it has served them well. You said that they are the survivors, right? Yes. So it has served them over the years and this information doesn't do anything for them. Um, it's not, so to some extent, this is not, yeah, this is a little bit different because I'm not removing the exact same level for everyone, yeah. but it would look something like that as well. So you see here, the one that are higher is those who had higher prior to begin with. Yeah. So they yeah. updated, but I haven't run it exactly. So, you know, you, we can run this regression with interaction and you get no significant interaction, mm -hmm. but we could also look, so rather than the accuracy, you want to look at the prior Price, yeah. to see, yeah. Again, it will look something similar because this is prior minus a constant, which is, which yeah. varies slightly across respondent, but not. Right. But, the, but when you bring in the, the information, you, you expect them. So there's a, extra agent involved, an outsider who's giving them the information. And to the extent that they believe the agent or not believe the agent could be different by the prior as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's true. We could look at the prior as well, yeah. Thank you, yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, so that's where we are and, you know, except that this is, except that everybody uniformly updated upward, you know, this is what we anticipated with our, with our information intervention. Then come the bit that was a little bit surprising to us is that although we see this positive treatment effect on um, the uh, population survival expectation, we don't see a positive treatment effect in their own survival expectation. So this is measure, this uh, long-term is the one uh, at the follow-up. This is measure exactly at the same time as the population one. And, you know, there's, when you get this null effect, you worry a bit about power, but you can see that, you know, for the healthy one, this is precisely estimated and a magnitude of 0 0.04. For the own one, it's 0 0.004. So it's 10%, you know, 10, uh, 10 times smaller uh, with a similar uh, standard error. So there seemed to be no treatment effect on the survival expectation. And that, you know, was surprising us for, for a long time. So we tried to understand what is going on. Um, one possibility is that, you know, these long run uh, survival expectation may capture behavioral changes to some extent because people adopted safer sex practice, you should magnify the treatment effect and not go the other way around, but maybe their behavior we're not uh, capturing. But what we can do is to look at this um, uh, survival expectation about uh, one, uh, about own survival expectation measured just a few 
days after the treatment effect. And this is a short term revision. This is like a week or two after uh, we gave them the information. And this is, whoops, sorry, this is uh, also um, uh, very small and imprecise. And these ones are unlikely to suffer from any feedback effect from, from behavior. So this is unlikely that you know, this feedback effect of behavior uh, explain this, this no result. So we're looking at other expect you know, other reason. One of them could be that for some people, at least information is not relevant. And maybe that goes to some of the question we had before. So, you know, if you think you're in very good health or in very poor health, then what you tell me about the overall population will mean nothing. So we exclude respondents for whom their own survival expectation is very different from the population survival and see whether we get a positive treatment effect removing those guys. And we still see nothing. Um, we also, for them, look at this prior accuracy. Um, we have, maybe I need to look also at their prior, like you were saying, Tusha. Uh, but there is no heterogeneous effect by prior accuracy. So it's not that we get zero because a bunch of people update upward and other update downward. And so you see a, a, a null uh, average treatment effect. What I think, you know, makes sense is this notion of, of private information or tight prior. So people may have a lot more private information about their own survival than about the population survival. You know, if you think in a Bayesian setup, if you have a lot of private information, your belief will be very tight. And when you get new information, it's not going to shift it uh, all that much. So your own survival expectation might be much less responsive to new information than population survival expectation. So here, you know, we didn't ask about this tightness of, of prior. Um, we're using, the fact that we have the panel data and look at people uh, who have not uh, reported zero and one in the past few weeks. So you can think people who say um, zero and one maybe have, you know, they think they're in particularly bad health or in particularly good health. Uh, and so those guys have tied prior. So if I exclude respondents who tend to report zero and one in the previous wave, I see a tiny bit of a treatment effect for one of the time horizons. So it's not fully convincing, uh, but it seems you know, it's one suggestive evidence of what we think is playing a role here, which is that people have a lot more private information or, you know, overconfidence like some people. I can't say whether it's one or the other, but these own survival are less responsive to new information than this population survival. Private information, overconfidence uh, could, could explain this. Um, this was a little bit uh, surprising, not what we expected. And then we are, well, why did people change behavior? their sexual behavior, if they didn't update their own survival, they don't think they're gonna live longer. So why are they adopting safer sex practice? So this is where we go back to our uh, uh, next other mechanism I put forward uh, earlier, which is that maybe because people believe that HIV positive people live longer, which we have seen in the population um, survival expectation treatment effect, they also think that the risk of having sex with other partner has increased. And indeed, this is essentially what we see. So we ask some various uh, probabilities about risk transmission. One of them is the probability that you get infected if, you have, if you're married to an HIV positive partner. So that I view it as the technology of HIV transmission. You condition on the HIV status of your partner and you see what's the transmission risk. There is no treatment effect here where we see a positive treatment effect is in this transmission risk here, which asks respondents, what's the chance you contract HIV if you have extramarital sex, or if you have multiple partner in addition to, to your spouse. And this is something that is going to depend on this local HIV prevalence. And so it's likely to be affected by um, the um, increase in HIV positive survival uh, expectation that we see. And that's, you know, what matter is kind of this difference in the risk, the re transmission risk for risky sex versus safe sex. And this is where we see this, this positive treatment effect. Um, so unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of expectation in this wave. We didn't ask belief about the local prevalence, which we have done in other waves. Uh, but it is very consistent. The fact that we have no effect on the transmission um, technology of HIV, but an effect on this transmission with multiple partners suggests really that this is this local HIV prevalence uh, that has uh, changed. Um, 
And I'm going to conclude here. Uh, so this is, you know, um, the first experiment looking at the causal effect of providing information about population mortality risk on health behavior. Um, this inform intervention was effective at increasing subjective population survival expectation in a low income context like Malawi with effects pertaining one year after we provided the information. Um, a bit contrary to what we expected, the intervention was not effective at changing um, own survival expectation on average, plausibly because individuals have private information about uh, own survival. Um, this is relevant for other type of information intervention because it shows that the elasticities of belief may depend really on the extent of private information and not all expectations are equally malleable. And maybe that explains why you know, some of this um, health information campaign had an effect in some contexts, but not others, because maybe they're targeting uh, belief that in some cases are, are very tight. Um, we also see, you know, this was the primary uh, behavioral uh, change we were trying to induce. Uh, we have this decrease in risky sexual behavior. It's, it appears driven by the externalities of other people living longer through this change in transmission risk perception. I have to say that this transmission risk perception was overestimated to begin with. So we actually made people less accurate about that because we increased it. Uh, and we also didn't target it uh, at all. And you know, if we didn't have the expectation data, I think we would have stuck with this idea that, well, people have changed their own survival and this is why, what is going on. Uh, but the mechanism is actually um, uh, quite different uh, than, than what you know, we, our model might have said. Uh, and so maybe, you know, this survival uh, information this, uh, is potentially, you know, an important policy tool to reduce uh, risky sexual behavior and other, you know, life cycle behavior in, in, in various contexts. Um, and I'll stop here for now. Great. Well, thank you, um, Adeline. Thanks very much. Very interesting presentation. We have roughly 10 minutes for questions. So please fire away if you have any questions for Adeline. Thank you for all the questions so far. That was quite useful. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go first. If, yeah, okay. So two questions. The first is basically, I might have missed this, but why wouldn't, why didn't you have a treatment arm where you just give information about your own mortality risk? Like you, know, you have biomarkers on these people. Um, I mean, so this is a lot more complicated to implement. So if you want to think about a policy that you can roll out quite inexpensively to begin with, then it seems a, a very natural candidate to have this general information, right? So uh, I think there's some evidence that personalized health risk work better, but they're a lot more expensive to, to put in place. Uh, maybe they, so we, to some extent, you know, we give them uh, this HIV information, but it's not a component yeah. we exploit, yeah. There's this problem of agency, right? I mean, you know, when you think about your own health, you have some agency and therefore what others tell you, well, that's not what will affect it, what I do will affect it, right? But when yeah. you think, when you give them information about population health, then they, are, then they actually believe it because, you know, that's about the population where they have no agency over, right? So what you find is like, you know, what I would have expected, I wouldn't have, thought that, you know, the intervention will affect individual expectation. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I didn't think so. So the, f the reason why I didn't think so is that they are very correlated, own and survival. And, yeah. you know, in other contexts, when you give people information about population earning, that tend to shift individual earning as well, even though yeah. not one to one. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't expect the effect to be to have been as strong maybe as the population one, but I was a little bit surprised by the no effect. But you know, maybe if they were underestimating, underestimating by a lot more, they might have been a bit of a dating. But yeah, this idea of agency or you know tight prior overconfidence is, I think, is consistent with what we see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, just a couple, couple observations. Uh, not sure whether I. Uh, misunderstood or not. And the first one is, the, it seems that the average schooling uh, level is very low. Uh, one yes. with that affects the effectiveness of the treatment or not. That's the first point. The second point, uh, the average age is also close to 60. Uh, not sure about the official life expectancy age in Malawi. 
uh, very high or close, just or uh, just a little bit above six. That means it doesn't matter what trade me off. People know is when uh, uh, the old old the, the, the parents uh, are dying at a certain age. So it doesn't really change their expectation. Yeah. So um, in terms of education, that's a good point. I mean, they they are uh, they don't have a lot of schooling. We don't see a lot of heterogeneous. We don't see heterogeneous effect by education. But I have to say that we are we were not power to really detect heterogeneous effect uh, given our sample size. So. So yeah, that, that's what it is, right? We, when we look at them, there is the, the, when we look at this uh, interogenous treatment effect you know, with interaction, the interaction are not precisely estimated, but maybe we're a bit under power. Uh, in terms of the life expectancy, I mean, we, when we ask about this hypothetical individual, it's someone of the same age and sex, right? So, you know, I don't know. So from that perspective, they should extrapolate that these pers people are still alive, you know, then maybe that pertain to them or not. Maybe they had in mind that, you know, it also pertained to younger individual and they didn't apply. I mean, that I can't, I can't really say, but I think it speaks to the same, maybe the earlier comments that, uh, you know, there is agency or they are still alive and this is what happened to their parents. And so that's going to be less affected by new new information. I think it's it's a related point. Yeah, so you can find maybe in the end it was not that surprising, but, you know, I guess we had sometimes you go with a, a hypothesis and, and you you maybe it's it's uh, harder to change your mind on it uh, than not. But maybe, you know, it's it's reassuring that you think it's it's quite normal in the end, I suppose. <laughs> I have a quick question, Adeline. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, listening, I guess the thing I'm thinking about is, you know, if you um, see these videos and then I guess there's a likelihood that that may lead to some sort of misclassification and, you know, maybe like I've seen these videos, I should probably report that I'm using a condom even though I'm not. So, and I know you did some, some testing around that, but are you, I mean, how, I guess, how, how confident are you in, in the tests that you've done? I yeah. mean, I saw you did the, the Hausman test and to me, it seems like a bit of an Achilles heel to the paper, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm just intrigued on your thoughts yeah. on that. I yeah, I mean, so I think the self-reported of sexual behavior is always an issue and we can do what we can do. I mean, so the, you know, to some extent, I, we didn't say anything about sexual behavior in our uh, intervention. So I don't think we cued them. And at some point, you know, when we were at the design stage, I was even thinking, you know, we're asking too much from them. And B, we should tell them, you know, if you live longer, you should act, you know, you should adopt safe sex practice. And we decided, well, okay, you know, this is ideally you could have, if you have a lot of power, you could have multiple arms, but we didn't have. So we decided not to. So... So I, I take your point that they might be misreporting. I don't think there was an interviewer demand effect by telling people you live longer that we really cued them on sexual behavior and that they would report that based on that. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, this was a year after, you know, like, so it's not that it's, I would be more worried maybe if we were just asking them on the spot after showing the intervention. Um, so that's, that's one issue. The other, you know, uh, robustness check was to look at this pregnancy in this younger sample, which is, you know, so we don't have, there's not enough um, HIV uh, incidents for us to pick that up, uh, to, pick a to pick up a change of behavior through that. We don't have my biomarker for sexually transmitted diseases, which could be another route. Uh, so I think pregnant, you know, I'm quite happy we find this effect uh, on pregnancy, uh, which I don't think we can do anything else. And, I, and the other thing is the effect on marriage, uh, which you could still view as a, you know, a risk reduction strategy, which is not going to be, I think, you know, misreported in this context. We see if these people live together or not. So, so that's not, uh, so it's not bulletproof, you know, I, uh, the self-reported sexual behavior always create questions. Um, uh, but, you know, often when you measure the biomarker and the self-reported behavior, they are very correlated. Uh, uh, and so it's not perfect, but I think that I don't expect the, the misreporting really to be different by treatment and control. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. If anyone has a, a last question for Adeline. Uh, Emmy, yes. Emilio? Yes. Yeah. Hi. In the paper, there are some references to an effect uh, through which, um, I mean, these households increase investment in their farms after the treatment. 
Yeah. I'm thinking if, if they didn't change their own survival expectations, why did they increase investment in their own farms? Yeah, so that's, uh, I th so the way we're thinking about it, but I don't have the direct mechanism is that, you know, I, I think they think everyone in their household might live longer, including their children or their spouse potentially. And so there may be um, uh, a rational for investment in, in some activity that will benefit others. So that's the way we're thinking about it. I didn't show them today. We're kind of reshaping a bit the paper and, and um, decided maybe to have a more focus on, on the sexual behavior. But these results are, are still interesting. We see, for example, one more chicken as a result of the treatment effect, which is like a, an important uh, asset, you know, uh, that can be increased in this one year time frame uh, that we have. Um, and I, I think that's my interpretation that they think these gains will also pertain to their household member. Um, Could it also just be they're more confident about the market? So they, they you know, think they're people around them are going to live longer, they'll have more customers and... Yeah, it could be actually, I didn't think about that, but uh, yeah, you may have higher return, you know, in, in selling your, your goods. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you have a final question that you wanted to ask? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still thinking about these biased expectations. Um, I haven't come up with any resolution other than, um, when you have these subjective survival probabilities, you, you can relate those directly to the discount rate. You know, the, yeah. the probability, subjective probability of death under certain models, you can view that as the subjective discount rate. So, mm -hmm. so, so that gives you what, uh, what you had in your model uh, uh, might be a, a more, more satisfactory way to, to get at it. Um, the other thing is... Um, that there's this idea that uh, people uh, overestimate their longevity as evidenced by the fact that they leave a state. So the idea is that uh, uh, people save to finance their old age, but money left over is a mistake and that can be viewed indirectly as evidence of people uh, overestimating longevity. I mean, so I guess the bequest motives are another alternative for leaving bequests for, and the other, you know, it's a, so, so mortality is stochastic, right? So you could have accurate prediction about your survival curve, but you know, draw, have a random draw and leave some uh, estates, for example. So I don't know, uh, yeah, yeah, I so don't know that I would take bequest as really evidence of biases in, in life expectancy. I think it's not so straightforward. If you ask individuals in the US, you know, these similar survival expectations, you tend to have uh, pessimism, at, so typically these are people, you know, in the retire, health and retirement survey, for example, so they are also mature. Uh, you would have pessimism until age 85, maybe 90, and then people become optimistic if they've survived at very old age. Um, hmm. so, so this is not, you know, particular to the Malawi context. We have similar results from uh, India and there's some evidence you know, for Europe and the US as well, when you ask these expectations directly, not through, you know, bequests, mm. for example. Thanks. Well, great. Well, thank you. I think we might leave it here. Um, please join me in thanking Adeline and thank you everyone for a very lively um, and engaging discussion. So thank you once again, Adeline. Thanks to everyone. Yeah, it was great. It's great on Zoom when people are <laughs> asking questions and you don't feel alone <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> Okay, bye. Right, Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Bye now.